Okay, he hello and welcome to everybody to this uh, international meeting of condensed uh, matter physics. That's for the first time will be held uh, in a virtual form by the Zoom platform. This is uh, due, of course, uh, the situation, the pandemic situation we are living that have altered completely our lives, in particular in the university and scientific activities that have been to, to introduce many changes. But this is a real proof that the science will continue without any you know, alteration in spite of the situation we are living. For me, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you very much for the, your invitation uh, to host this, uh, this uh, important Congress in the Autonoma University of, of Madrid, even in this virtual form. And in the first time I, uh, I introduce you, Maria Jose Calderon, that is the president of the Condensed Matter Physics Division of the Spanish uh, Society of Physics. And Maria Jose. Your time. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. On behalf of the Spanish Condensed Matter Physics Division, known as JEFES, welcome to CMD 2020 JEFES Online. JEFES is the most active unit of the Spanish Royal Physics Society. This is, in fact, an indication of the strength of the condensed matter community in Spain, a heritage from important Spanish scientists such as Miguel Catalan, discoverer of atom multiplets and Blas Cabrera, a pioneer of modern magnetism. JEFES celebrates very popular scientific meetings, and we also work on giving special support to the youngest researchers. We invite you to check our webpage for information about this course and our activities. The local organization of CMD 28 was entrusted to JEFES by the European CMD two years ago, and the three chairs, Herman Suderov, Jose Maria de Teresa, and I, have been working since for the successful celebration of this 28th edition of the European Condensed Matter Conference. As you know, we were planning to hold a meeting in Madrid, precisely in the campus, with the largest concentration of condensed matter physicists in Spain, but the current pandemic circumstances that we hope haven't affected you personally, forced us to find another way to celebrate the conference and in this manner keep offering the condensed matter physics community a platform for scientific discussion and collaboration so much needed in these extraordinary times. In the last few months have been very intense with online meetings, thousands of emails and tests of all the possible online platforms that you may think of. With only a few months in advance and our society's lack of previous experience in the organization of big online conferences with parallel sessions, it has been a real challenge to find a formula that would allow the celebration of the meeting while making it accessible and free of charge for everyone interested. There have been a lot of obstacles in our way that we have overcome with the dedicated collaboration of a very large committee, a supporting administrative team, and the financial support of a few sponsors. Thank you all. The long working hours dedicated to the organization of CMD 2020 Jefes Online are already paying off with the registration of more than 2,000 participants from 75 different countries. In particular, the response from the Spanish community has been overwhelming with more than 500 participants. From this, more than 100 belong to my institution, the Spanish Research Council, or CSIC, the SIC, which uh, with, many, uh, with more than 100 centers, is the seventh largest research institution in the world. I must say that one of the most interesting characteristics of this conference is the direct participation of the scientific community in the organization of thematic mini colloquia. We want to thank the 112 scientists involved in the organization of the 35 mini colloquia that constitute the main part of this conference and the hundreds of speakers participating in the sessions, some of them waking up in the wee hours to join us from the other side of the world. We also want to thank the advisory board and the program committee who are behind the design of the scientific program and the plenary and semi-plenary speakers who have enthusiastically adapted to the online format. And finally, thanks to the organizers of the special sessions on diversity in science and EPS Young Minds, the latter especially designed for physics students and the young researchers, our future. So thank you all for your attention and please enjoy the meeting. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Maria Jose. Uh, I introduce now you, Professor Kis van der Beek, who is the chairman of the European, the, uh, the, of the, of the um, uh, matter physics, uh, European physical uh, the division in the European Physical Society. Uh, so, Professor Kis uh, van der Beek, when, the, when you like, please. Unmute yourself. You, you have to yeah, mute myself. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, dear colleagues and dear friends, it's great to see you in such numbers. Uh, we are in 2020 in a year which is really quite unlike anything else we have seen. We have the COVID 19 pandemic, which has completely altered the way that we work, the way we go about our daily business, and even our ways of society. We have all been forced to construct in a very little time uh, new manners to interact, to work, to maintain the fabric of our research, our collaboration networks, teaching, as well as our institutions. And I would like to particularly think of the young scientists, particularly the women in the first half of their career, where the collision of professional and family duties have resulted in really unprecedented pressure and difficulties in maintaining our usual research output and activity. It is therefore, it makes me all the happier to see so many of us together here attending this first wholly online edition of the General Conference of the Condensed Matter Division of the European Physical Society, CMD. So this conference follows CMD 27, which was held with the DPG in Berlin in 2018. Before that, we had CMD 26 in Groningen, the Netherlands. 2016 and CMD 25 with the French Physical Society in 2014. This 28th edition of CMD, as Marie Jose said, is co organized by EPS CMD and the Consmatter Group, Jefes of the Royal Spanish Physical Society, as CMD 2020 Jefes. We were to be on the campus of the Universidad Autonoma de Madrid, but all our enthusiastic preparations which was well on the way, have been stopped short in their tracks by the pandemic in the month of March. We really hope, I hope that this situation will involve favorably so that CMD and Jefes, we will be able to offer an on-site conference, if large and festive, within the next two or three years. However, we cannot stop the pursuit of science, the pursuit of higher learning, which according to us is one of the main keys to advancing our complex technological society and even our well-being as mankind. We cannot idle, we must go forward. So in April, with the Spanish co-organizers and the community, the organizers of the mini colloquia and the plenary and Spanish speakers, we had a discussion and concluded that the conference must go on and scientific communication, our European and international research networks, the exchange of ideas has to continue. Our lab work, research, our classes have been weakened enough as they are by the COVID-19 pandemic, and we must find a way to continue to discuss and to work together, and this conference is one of these ways. Not being able to gather in person, we chose a fully online format. For the Condensed Matter Division of the EPS, this is the first time. We are also working on contingencies for the situation engendered by the pandemic, but at the same time, exploring new ways of communicating and working together, because this mode of working together, I think, is here to stay. Your presence in large numbers testifies to you as a community's adhesion to this approach by our, our learned societies. As was said, there are nearly 1,000 scientific contributions to CMD 2020 Jefes online, 2,000 registered participants from nearly all countries in Europe, as well as from the other four continents. And I would really like to welcome the very large delegation who is joining us online from Latin America, the large number of participants from Asia, and those joining us from Africa and the Middle East. Welcome. Our large and diverse audience today illustrates that this COVID pandemic, as any crisis, also presents opportunities. Opportunities for new ways of communicating, new ways of working together, 
and tear down walls that would separate us. In the tradition of CMD, this week's scientific program, which has five plenary and eight semi-plenary talks, as well as the 35 online mini colloquia, will cover all areas of condensed matter physics, as well as its very many disciplinary interfaces. In such, CMD 2020 GEFES reflects the wealth of our research, the impact of condensed matter physics on other academic subjects, and in the search on solutions for society's challenges. Please be reminded, we have mini colloquia in the morning, but there are also afternoon special sessions with pre-recorded talks and posters, live discussions. You can discuss with the authors in breakout rooms. You can discuss posters. Please familiarize yourself with the presentations beforehand so that these uh, special sessions can be a success. In this week, we will also have several prize sessions. I would really like to recommend uh, these to you, since prizes recognize what we consider the most outstanding work performed in the field of condensed matter physics by us as a community. Next Wednesday at half past two, the CMD Europhysics Prize will be awarded to Jörg Brachtrup of Stuttgart University. And on Friday, also at half past two, we will celebrate the Oli V. Launasma Prize for Low Temperature Physics, which will be awarded to Shemus Davis of the University College in Cork and Oxford University. The 2020 Heffes Awards will be allotted on Thursday afternoon at five o'clock. So please be sure to join us in these prize sessions. Today, starting today at five, there are also special sessions devoted to more general questions that we may have as scientists, as physicists. And I think that especially this year, we have plenty. They concern the role and position of physicists and physics in society. The first session, EPS Young Minds, forum discussions on career choices for young physicists, issues of publishing and the peculiarities of different journals. Also today at five, a session on diversity and inclusiveness. And on Thursday at half past one, the General Assembly of our EPS Condensed Matter Division. I would like to very warmly thank our Spanish colleagues, in particular Maria Jose Calderon, Herman Sudro, and Jose Maria de Teresa, and the Rector of the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid for making this online conference CMD 2020 GEFES possible. It was really quite a challenge, and I think success is here. I would like to thank all speakers, all the organizers of the online mini colloquia, all the members of our advisory committee, the many local organizers, who solved all the outstanding technical problems and you for being there uh, with us for your adherence and your participation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Van der Beek. Uh, for me, only to emphasize that it is a real pleasure to be here in this opening session. I think that it is a great achievement to have uh, assumed the challenge to organize this important meeting. Uh, in the first time, I would like to congratulate the organizers for the success of this with uh, uh, many, it's more than 2,000 particip participants in, the, in this meeting. For me, it's also a, a real pleasure because as uh, Maria Jose has introduced you, uh, our university, the Universidad Autónoma uh, de Madrid, uh, was uh, created, was born more or less 50 years ago. Uh, so we are relatively young. And from the beginning, we start a very close relationship with our colleagues of the National Research Council. Uh, now there are uh, 10 institutes, very big institutes, located in our campus and belonging to different fields of, of, of scientific activity, including, including uh, condensed matter physics. Uh, in fact, as Maria Jose has also introduced you, uh, this campus has a large concentration of physics work, of, of scientists working in this field, uh, probably one of the largest in, in, in Europe. So for me, it's a, very very important to be to be here participating in this in the, in this moment. Also, I would like to 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 to, to share with you my my my, my feeling that the this pandemic the situation we are living uh, has reinforced the role of science in our society. 
you know, the higher education, the generation of new knowledge, and the scientific activity needs to be the basis of the construction and the progress of our society in the future. Not only for combat this situation like a virus pandemic, uh, pandemia, but many different things that will happen in the future. And we need to be very well prepared to cope with this situation. And the only way is to reinforce the science, reinforce the scientific activity, reinforce the higher education, reinforce the collaboration between the different institutions, the multifactorial uh, uh, you know, collaboration and multidisciplinary uh, uh, focus of the different problems and so on. And in this, in this specific uh, term, I think that uh, condensed matter physics is paradigmatic in the sense that is not perhaps the area, the field of the physics more uh, known, you know, but is uh, one of the, the that very well combine the different approach of different specialties. That it, there is the interface of many scientists' point of view that are not only devoted to uh, generate new knowledge, uh, basic knowledge, but that this knowledge may be easily transferred to the improvement of the quality of life of the people, to the progress of the society. So for me, is a, perhaps I can't imagine a, a best way to start this academic new year, this special and very, in this moment, uh, unpredictable as how to, to will evolve in the future new academic year that participating in this opening session. For, for this reason, I would like to thank very heartily, very warmly to the organized Maria Jose Calderon, Jose Maria de Teresa, and Herman Sudrop, two of them working in this camp, Una Jose Maria in, in Zaragoza. And welcome you. And, and, and I, I hope that you enjoy this meeting. The personal interaction is many, many important in the development of science. It's critical, I would say, but this may be achieved in many different ways. And as Professor Van der Beek uh, also has uh, emphasized, this uh, situation offer also new opportunities. And this opportunity is to, to get in contact uh, at distance with this uh, platform we are now using so frequently, but maintain the level of interchange of ideas, discussion, and you know the contact and and, and, and the way that the, 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 the sign needs to to, 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 to to progress, need for, for, for the progress. That is the, the personal interaction, the direct interaction that not need not to be uh, necessary in the same physical space as we can now approving now in uh, in this opening session. So thank you very much, uh, Herman, Maria Jose, Jose Maria, for your invitation. I hope that you enjoy very much and this will be a very fruitful pro uh, meeting and congress for all of you. Uh, I know, and although I, I, I work in a different field, that the program has been prepared very carefully. And this is a fantastic program that you surely uh, enjoy very much. So for me, uh, welcome to this uh, session. Thank you. And now I give the, 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 the way to Professor Jose Maria uh, uh, de, de Teresa for introduce the first speaker, Pablo, Pablo Jarillo. Thank you very much to all of you and welcome. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. So welcome uh, to the first plenary talk of CMD 2020 Jefes Conference. My name is Jose Maria de Teresa from the Institute of Nanoscience and Materials in Aragon, in Zaragoza, in the north of Spain. I'm one of the conference chairs and I will serve as chairman in this plenary session. So it's an honor to introduce a speaker who does not need a long introduction in the field of condensed matter physics. His name is Pablo Jarillo Herrero, full professor at MIT in Boston, US. And you have probably heard his name in relationship to the experimental discovery of the magic angle in twisted uh, bilayer graphene, which uh, produces superconductivity and other interesting strongly correlated electron phenomena. 
So thanks to this discovery that occurred only two years ago, we use today new terms in condensed matter physics, such as flat band moires, moire superlattices, or even twistronics. So for this discovery, he has recently received the prestigious uh, Wolf Prize. But apart from that, as some of you may know, Pablo is a charming person born in Spain. And we celebrate that he still belongs to the Spanish Royal Physics Society, which long time ago in 2006 awarded him its prize for young researchers. So Pablo, thank you for your participation in the conference. The virtual podium is yours and uh, attendees will have the opportunity to ask uh, questions at the end of the talk using the chat. Thank you. So let me see, can you all see my screen? Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, very good, excellent. So thank you, whoops. Thank you very much everyone uh, and especially uh, Maria Jose, Jose Maria and Herman for the invitation to, to this conference. As you can see my, in my background here, this is where I, I, you know, we should all be, okay? Madrid is, is one of my favorite cities in the world, of course, as you can imagine, me is always good to be home. And I'm a little bit sad that I cannot be, uh, you know, in Spain with all of you, but um, at the same time, uh, I think that, um, you know, there's, there's always a small silver lining to everything. And, and, and this, in these cases that I can see, let me see, I can see in the participants that there are more than 400 people uh, there watching. And I think that this aspect that you can reach uh, really a lot of people through these online platforms, it's it's you know it's very important, and I'm and I'm glad that so many of you could could join for the for today's talk. So I want to tell you about our um, you know a little bit about our recent experiments um, on this, uh, on, on magic angle graphene. Okay, that I think you know some of you may be familiar with some of it, and and others not. So I will start from a a bit more of a general introduction, and then quickly tell you some, some of the latest things that we've been uh, working on. So the, you know, the, the field of correlated more heterostructures, you know, um, one of the nicest things that I find in this field is that it has meant the merging of different condensed communities, which were not always present, uh, always working uh, together, you know, and we have on one hand, the, to the even the vast materials and heterostructures community, you know, which started, you know, you know, about 15, 20 years ago with graphene. Then you have the more, you know, traditional strongly correlated materials, and then the more modern topological condensed matter physics community. All of these three communities come together in this field of correlated more heterostructures. And, and for me, certainly it's, it's, it's a tremendous opportunity to learn from, from all of these, uh, you know, all my colleagues in these communities and, and so many students that are joining and that are, you know, it's, it's producing this very thriving field. So let me tell you about, you know, how, how you know, some of these, um, you know, experiments, you know, came to be. And for that, I need to introduce, uh, you know, graphene and twisted bilayer graphene. So I think probably most of you are quite familiar with graphene. Let me just go very quickly. Graphene is a honeycomb of carbon atoms that you can see here. And its electronic structure is, you know, it's, it's band structure is, is here on the top in a simple high binding, tight binding Hamiltonian. You can calculate what is the dispersion of, you know, the energy versus momentum for electrons in graphene and near the Fermi energy, near charge neutrality, you have these very interesting and usual Dirac cones with the charge neutrality point. Yeah? Now, if you look in uh, momentum space, you have this Brillouin zone, this hexagonal Brillouin zone. And if you put your Fermi energy at a finite value in graphene, such as here, then you get these Fermi disks at the so-called K and K prime points. Now, what happens if you put one sheet of graphene on top of another sheet of graphene? Yeah? If you just stack them at the exact same angle, then the electronic structures are sort of overlapping. You know, the real space lattice overlaps and the momentum space, the reciprocal space lattices overlap too. Okay. and the electronic structures are just on top of each other. Now, something that you can do with 2D materials that it was impossible to do before in the history of material science is that you can arbitrarily rotate two 2D materials that you stack on top of each other to create a boring pattern, okay? So now, what happens to the electronic structures 
when you do this, okay? When you create this Moray pattern. So if you rotate by an angle, you know, these two in real space, these two lattices, turns out that the reciprocal spaces also rotate and by the same angle. Okay? So as you can see, this leads to the Dirac cones of, of you know, graphene layer one and graphene layer two to separate in momentum space. So twisting leads to this layer Dirac cone separating in momentum space. Okay, and the amount of separation has to do with what's the angle of rotation. Now, let me start Okay, let me start from an angle, which is a small angle of rotation, so that the separation in momentum space between these Dirac cones, okay, between these charge neutrality points is proportional to the angle, yeah. This is the situation that would occur if these two graphene sheets, which are on top of each other, they didn't know, you know, if the electrons in one sheet didn't know that the other sheet, graphene sheet exists. The two layers would just, the, the two Dirac cones would just interpenetrate each other like this. However, because these two graphene sheets are just three angstroms apart from each other, electrons can tunnel between the two graphene sheets. Yeah? This leads to interlayer hybridization. Okay? And you get as a result this gap, you know, a gap, you know, band repulsion at this crossing point here. Okay? You can think of this as bonding anti-bonding states in a hydrogen molecule. Okay, so you have that one band gets pushed up, another band gets pushed down here. Okay, now this is the situation that occurs when this angle of rotation is such that this interlayer hybridization is still small compared to the original energy at which this crossing point occurs. Now, what happens then is that as you decrease, as you decrease the twist angle towards smaller and smaller angles, okay, this energy, the energy of this crossing point gets lower and lower in energy. And therefore, when this interlayer hybridization occurs, this lower band gets pushed down lower and lower and lower, okay? And at some point, you reach a condition where this interlayer hybridization is of the same order as this energy crossing point, and that leads to something known as a flat band condition, okay? And this flat band condition is reached for an angle of rotation, okay? which is dependent on what two materials you put on top of each other. But for the case of graphene, it was you know, coined by Bistos and McDonald as the magic angle. Yeah? And it happens to be about 1.1 degrees. Yeah? Now, I, I should mention that there were very interesting experiments uh, at a bit, about the same time, a little bit earlier, by the group of Ivan Dre, demonstrating already that you know, there's a very interesting you know, signature in the STM spectroscopy, Van Hoff singularity that takes place here at this energy that moves towards zero at about this angle. 1.1 degrees. And there was also earlier work by Soros Morel predicting that there would be these flat bands, you know, uh, at, at small angles in twisted by layer graphene. Now, this thing that I mentioned is, a, is sort of a cartoon. Let me show you an actual calculation of the electronic structure. Okay. Again, these are the two graphene reciprocal spaces you know, for layer one and for layer two. If you join the corners of the Brillouin zones, you can form the super lattice Brillouin zone. Okay. You can see it's a small super lattice below and so on because the moiré pattern that you form is a long wavelength moiré pattern. So in this video here on the side, I'm going to show this is the energy versus momentum for twisted by layer graphene. This is for an angle of three degrees right here. I'm gonna run a video now, but what you can see is that within this, you know, for this angle, three degrees within this energy window, this basically looks like Dirac cones, okay? So twisted by layer graphene at, within this small energy window looks like exactly the same as graphene. But as I run now this video, you're gonna see how this electronic structure changes when you go towards small angles. So let me do this. So as you can see, we have a set of bands now that is becoming separated from the more remote bands by band gaps. And this is, these bands are becoming flatter and flatter. And now you see, they became very, very flat. And then the band structure continues evolving. Let me run this video again. Okay? You see that this band structure is becoming you know, flatter and flatter, and at about 1.1 degrees, it becomes very flat down there, okay? And now, when you make devices, you know, when, when you know, when, when you make devices at, at about this angle, you know, again, this is not a snapshot of one of those frames in the previous video. In this case, for 105 degrees, include these light relaxations, you can see there is this very flat band, and then we have these remote bands with a higher 
dispersion at low energies. Yeah? Now, if we make devices when you put, place the chemical potential in this flat band, interesting physics happens, okay? And in particular, what we discovered a couple of years ago is that when you put an integer number of electrons, particular two electrons per more unit cell out of a maximum of four electrons or four holes per more unit cell that you can put in this flat band, when you put two electrons per more unit cell, which is called, you know, sometimes filling factor two or super lattice density, maximum super lattice density divided by two, you have unusual correlated electronic states. These electronic states only happen for angles very close to the magic angle, okay? And then if you dope a little bit away from these correlated insulated states, you have superconducting domes, yeah? So magic angle graphene is superconducting, and this is something which was quite unexpected and has generated a lot of enthusiasm in the community. Now, let me go back a little bit and, and tell you a bit more about this phase diagram. So this is the phase diagram of large, you know, of graphene and also large angle twisted by layer graphene yeah? in a plot of temperature versus density, okay? Density here now is in arbitrary units. There is only one interesting point, charge neutrality or the Dirac point. When you put your Fermi level or your charge density at zero, okay, there's this interesting Dirac point. And then the behavior around it is just of a metal, okay? Graphene now, as you know, is a very interesting material, but from the point of view of the phase diagram, this is sort of what you see in, in you know, at zero magnetic field, etc. Now, if you have <coughs> A small angle twisted by layer graphene. Okay, then the situation becomes a little bit more interesting. And now what I say here, density, I'm now using filling factor, which is the density of electrons normalized by how many, you know, electrons I can put, you know, in a super lattice, uh, uh, more units, you know, the, sorry, the number of electrons that I put in normalized by the super lattice uh, area more unit cell area. So this number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4 indicates 1, 2, 3, 4 electrons per more unit cell or 1, 2, 3, 4 holes per more unit cell. And as I mentioned earlier, in these flat bands, I can put up to eight electrons, okay, from bottom to top. So from charge neutrality, four electrons or four holes per more unit cell. When you reach, you know, those points, the top of the conduction band or the bottom of the balance band here, then you have a band insulator behavior from the electronic transport point of view because you, you reach this band gap before you can, with your Fermi energy, move on to your remote bands. And so you have band insulator states. These band insulator states are from single particle origin, okay? So they are well understood. We saw them some, some time ago and has been many, reproduced by many people. Now, what happens for magic angle graphene? Okay, these, you know, these bands become very flat. And now if you zoom in and you put their carriers in your flat bands, as you put one, two, three, four electrons or holes per more unit cell, we have in addition to charge neutrality and band insulators, we have these correlated insulated states that happens around two and minus two holes per more unit cell. Yeah. And then as you dope, you know, minus two minus delta, minus two plus delta, et cetera, you have superconducting states, okay? Now this was what, you know, the situation was in, in mid, you know, 2018. Let me tell you about some of the latest developments. And by the way, I should mention that, you know, uh, after, you know, soon after our discovery, a related system, ABC trilayer graphene aligned with respect to hexagonal boron nitride also produced similar type of correlated insulator states and other correlated physics. So it is much more, generic, this behavior that I'm talking about, and just magic angle graphene. There are by now plenty of other systems which exhibit this correlated physics behavior, plenty of correlated more heterostructures that the community is investigating. So now, this is the phase diagram that I mentioned just in the previous slide, okay? And this phase diagram keeps being updated very, very frequently, okay? It is sort of schematic, uh, it's precise, twist angle dependent, okay? And it's evolving very fast. So one thing that, you know, happened is that, you know, in this region around the correlated insulator state, <coughs> we and others have demonstrated that there is strange metal behavior where it's closer to charge neutrality, the behavior is more regular metal. 
We also find that the superconducting state exhibits anisotropies, you know, consistent with a pneumatic superconducting state. Some of these, we also have measured competition between superconductivity and other orders in the system, which also lead to anisotropies in the normal state of the system. And there's also nematicity in the normal state of the system, as I just mentioned. So in addition, if you look at, you know, one and three or one and three, you know, electrons or holes per mole unit cell, a lot of interesting physics happens. For example, magnetism here, here, we have interesting, you know, novel types of correlated states here. I'm not going to talk about some of these things only a little bit at the end, you know, basically this phase diagram is evolving very, very, very quickly and very fast. So this is turning into a platform to study all kinds of correlated states, which I think makes this tremendously interesting and especially attractive for the young generation of condensed matter physicists. So something that we've been doing, for example, recently is looking at, you know, you know, what do we mean by magic angle graphene, you know, you, you could argue is this, oh, this 1.1 degrees, but actually it turns out there is a range of angles, you know, over which, for example, the, the magic, if my magic you mean, for example, superconductivity happens, okay? So we have been measuring, for example, several devices now, and, and we have actually quite a bit more statistics than I'm showing now here, you know, and you can measure what is the critical temperature at optimal doping of the superconductor, okay? And you can see that the magic, you know, there is also a dome of superconductivity, but the dome is now TC versus angle, not the usual TC versus doping. And this dome seems to be picked pretty close to the original, you know, 1.1 degree, you know, between 105 and 1.1 degrees is where TC seems to be maximum, okay? And this lets us to, to, to the following question, you know, what should we call magic angle and what are the implications, okay? You know, from a theoretical point of view, you could argue, well, it's, it's, you know, why don't we take the original definition, which is the twist angle for which the Fermi velocity is zero or minimum at the K points, okay? Now, there is also another definition possible, which is the angle, the twist angle for which the bandwidth, okay, of that flat band is smallest, it's a minimum, okay? It turns out the angle for which this happens is not the same as the angle for which this happens. And then, there is, for example, another definition, the angle for which the density of states, in particular the Fanhoff singularities that occur in these flat bands, are strongest and narrowest. So the ones for which locally the band structure is flattest, not globally in momentum space, but locally in some momentum space region, the band structure is flattest. Okay, this that last definition was, for example, argued by the group of Av hypersupathy, you know, in the recent STM work. Now the thing is. We don't know yet theoretically how any of these definitions or others that we may come up with correlate with the type of behavior that we observe in these type of devices. Okay, for example, you know, should we name magic angle the one for which you know the strongest correlated insulated states appear, and for what feeling? Because different number of electrons per mole unit cell show different strength of correlated insulated physics, or should we choose instead the angle for which the highest TC occurs, okay? And how do these properties and many others that have been discovered now, how are they connected with this, you know, possible theoretical, you know, definitions of magic angle, okay? What is becoming clear now is that there is a range of angles, approximately, as you can see here, between 0.9 or 1 and 1.2, and over this range of angles, a lot of stuff happens, you know, superconductivity, correlated insulators, magnetism, a number of other phenomena, okay, for monolayer or monolayer graphene. And I think there's still a lot of work in the community that is needed to connect this type of theory with this type of phenomenology and others that are being, you know, discovered continuously. So with this pretty long introduction, let me now tell you a little bit about our latest uh, research. This is what I'm gonna tell you about in the next 20 minutes or so, is I'm gonna uh, tell you about some of this competition between different orders that we see in the phase diagram of magic angle twisted by layer graphene. Then I'll show you uh, our observations of pneumaticity in these samples. And then I'll end with some recent uh, results on measurements, thermodynamic measurements of compressibility, and in particular, the observation of a cascade of phase transitions 
and the arc like revivals in the system. So let me start with this. Now, this theme of competing orders or intertwined orders is something which has been, you know, uh, mentioned a lot in the in the context of uh, high temperature couplet superconductors. Yeah? This is the phase diagram of the high temperature couplet superconductors. At zero doping, you have an antiferromagnetic mod insulator, an insulated state. And as you dope, you get this famous superconducting dome. Now, as you can see here in this phase diagram, superconducting dome is not a single dome, it's sort of made of these two domes with a depletion, you know, with a depletion in, in TC, you know, in between. Yeah? Now, for some cuprates, such as you know, lanthanum barium copper oxide, this depletion can be very strong, almost to zero, you know, at this so-called one-eighth, you know, you know, 12.5 percent doping and you know, and this what eighth anomaly. Okay. This has to do with the presence of a competing order, in this case is stripe, you know, order at this doping. Okay? So now let me show you a little bit about our samples. Okay, so this is the phase diagram for a magic angle de device, 1.09 degrees. This is temperature versus density. Okay, we can see here zero density. This is charge neutrality point. This resistance, which I'm plotting on the color axis, has a high resistivity here at a charge neutrality point. And then you can see that interesting physics appear at one, two, three electrons per mole unit cell, also at two holes per mole unit cell. Now, let me zoom in a little bit more in this region here, okay? So in this region, now, this is two holes per mole unit cell. It has a weak but present correlated insulated state. And then there is this high temperature feature, okay? We call it sometimes the banana ridge, you know? But it's this resistance wedge of which here. And the dark blue is actually the superconducting dome, okay? Now, let me zoom in a little bit more in this region. Now, this is filling factor two holes per mole unit cell. This is doping with extra holes, so minus two minus delta. In terms of just hole doping, this is zero hole doping, and this is extra holes, okay? So as you can see, there is this resistance maximum which is happening here, and it's about 10% off in terms of doping from this correlated insulated state. Now, as you can see, we have a superconducting dome which has a depletion here at this point. Okay. Now, if you look at this, you know, when I saw first this data, you know, it looked very similar to this surface diagram that I had seen a number of times. Okay. Now, I don't want to make the comparison, I'm making a comparison with the cuprate because this is how we got inspired to study this. But of course, these two systems are very different. Okay. But let me just you know, go on with this data. So at the beginning when we saw this, we thought, okay, well, could this be that something is competing, you know, with superconductivity and really is trying to, to you know, to, to kill superconductivity here, but ultimately at low temperature superconductivity wins. Now, is there something, and um, you know, behind this, okay? So if we suppress superconductivity by, for example, applying a small magnetic field, perpendicular magnetic field, okay? Then we can see what does this ridge want to do when it gets down there, okay? So what we saw, you know, these are the data at zero magnetic field. If you now apply a finite magnetic field, we saw that this wedge leads into an insulating region at zero temperature, okay? Which is sort of connected to, you know, this, you know set of insulated states to the correlated insulated state at two holes per mole unit cell. But this stretch in particular leads to strongly insulating region here. If you take a vertical trace here so that you, know, you don't see only color plots, let me take vertical traces here at the exact same doping at zero and find a magnetic field. You can see that at zero magnetic field, the system becomes superconducting. At find a magnetic field, there is a metal to insulator transition, okay, at the same, at certain temperature. Now, at the beginning, you know, if you see this only once, then who knows what this could be due to. But of course, we have now started to see it in more and more devices, okay? This is another device with a twist angle about 107 degrees, okay? This phenomenology happens to be a little bit narrower in angular range than just the observation of superconductivity. We see it typically at, you know, 107 plus minus 0.03 degrees or so. The, the same angular range as indicated here. Okay? So we have another device here. You see again this prominent wedge, 
Okay, in this case, there is also a pretty weak correlated insulated state at two holes per molar unit cell. There is a depletion of TC here. And when you apply a finite magnetic field, you can see that this leads to an insulated state, in this case, separated from the original correlated insulated state, which becomes a bit stronger at finite magnetic field. And again, if you take traces at those locations, you see you know, superconductivity and you know, the insulated state, which happens at finite magnetic field, okay? So there seems to be something which is competing with superconductivity when you're a little bit off from the correlated insulated state. And that something which is competing with superconductivity has a resistivity maximum, you know, which evolves in this temperature versus density phase diagram. Okay? You can, of course, do this, you know, suppression by magnetic field continuously. Okay. So I'm plotting here TC. Okay. The, the, the traces are TC. The, the color map is actually an indication of the perpendicular magnetic field. Yeah. And the nice thing is that we can measure this continuously. You can see that at about 90 mini Tesla, you split this into two superconducting domes. The only the strongest one remains down to the maximum field of about, you know, 150 milli Tesla or so. Yeah? And this again is quite reminiscent of some of the behavior which is observed in the cuprets, except that in the cuprets you have to apply you know, up to 80 Tesla or more to split superconducting domes, you know, the overall superconducting dome into two superconducting domes. And of course, another difference is that we can take these measurements continuously. Yeah, these are continuous data point measurements, whereas this involves making different crystals and in some cases of different material classes in order to populate this diagram. So let me leave it at this and I'll come back to this phenomenology a little bit later, okay? So now let me switch a little bit gears and tell you about our observation of pneumaticity. So pneumaticity in correlated materials is something, you know, pneumaticity means spontaneous breaking of lattice rotational symmetry of some ordered parameter. Okay, your lattice has a certain symmetry, for example, fourfold, sixfold, threefold, and a pneumatic transition indicates that your lattice, uh, and, uh, sorry, that your order parameter, your system now chooses a direction. Okay, it goes from whatever symmetry to twofold symmetry because it chooses a direction. Now, many families of quantum materials show this, okay, nictites, cuprates, heavily doped topological insulators, etc. And nematicity can happen in the normal state of the system, in the superconducting state of the system, or in both, and it has different implications in each case. Now, nematicity you know, has perhaps been explored most uh, in, and more recently and in, in, with high intensity in the nictites, superconductors. This is a, a picture of phase diagram from this review by Rafael Fernandez and colleagues, where you can see that in the normal state, the system exhibits this, this Red region is the pneumatic transition, okay, in the normal state of the system. In doped topological insulators, such as, you know, doped, I think, you know, copper doped, strontium doped, etc., bismuth selenide, which is a superconductor, okay, you can see that the resistivity of the system, for example, or in this case is, you know, TC, exhibits two maxima, you know, in, in 160 degrees, in, in 360 degrees, exhibits these two maxima, indicating that the system goes from the you know, original hexagonal symmetry of the system to this twofold, you know, which means twofold means an ellipse, or in, in this case, it can be, you know, an ellipse or a peanut, okay? But basically, you have an axis of mirror symmetry, so you have twofold symmetry here. Okay? Now, the system has chosen a direction. Let me show you our data. So, and again, you can look at, you know, a lot of details about everything that I'm telling you in this, in this paper that we posted recently. So we have, you know, one of these magic angle graphene devices, and now we apply an in-plane parallel magnetic field. Okay. Sorry, I mentioned, I forgot to mention before, this behavior is as a function of angle, but angle means the magnetic field applied parallel to the bismuth selenide planes. Okay. So as you rotate the angle, you see this twofold in the critical temperature or in the resistivity. So, this is a pretty high TC sample. And by high TC, I mean relative to, you know, you know magic angle graphene superconducting TCs, okay? Three Kelvin at 50% normal state resistance. You can see beautiful superconducting curves, you know, with very nice switching currents. And of course, this superconductivity is, you know, dependent on the carrier density, okay? This is a log scale, 
Okay, this is one of those samples, by the way, which exhibits a depletion of TC around this point, which in log scale now is very clear. Okay? Now, if you measure the resistivity as a function of parallel magnetic field magnitude and orientation in plane, you see that we have these two maxima. Okay, two maxima means again twofold symmetry. It means an ellipse in polar coordinates. Okay, let me show you the actual ellipse. Okay, so this is again resistivity as a function of magnetic field in the x and y direction. We can see that there is an ellipse which means the system exhibits very different critical field, okay? When your field is oriented along this direction and when your field is oriented along the perpendicular direction, you have an ellipse, okay? And of course, this is for a particular doping and we can measure this at a variety of dopings and at a variety of temperatures, okay? We have to do these measurements at varying temperatures and dopings because we have only you know, we have in our dilution refrigerator a vector magnet which allows us to apply in-plane magnetic field, but we have a maximum in-plane magnetic field of one Tesla that we can rotate. And for example, if you go to optimal doping, such as, you know, this panel D, panel D here is close to optimal doping, you can see that within our one Tesla plane, the system is always superconducting, okay? We haven't reached the critical field in any direction. But as we go to, you know, even at 0.9 Kelvin, but as we go around the superconducting dome, these different panels show you what is the evolution of the nematicity, okay, of the critical field, you know, and you can see that you have these ellipses, okay. At base temperature, if we go to regions where we have very small TC, we can like such as JMK here, okay, we can see even at 50 millikelvin these ellipses. At optimal doping, we have to go all the way to two Kelvin to see the ellipse, okay. Now, if <clears throat> There's a lot of data here. All I want you to take from it, okay, it's hard to digest all of this. All I want you to take from this is the following, which is that the ellipse major axis, okay, is oriented along different directions, as you can see here between E and G, for example, for different dopings, okay? So the system is exhibiting a twofold direction symmetry, but that twofold, that axis, which is called the pneumatic director axis, is actually rotating as we change the electron density in the system, okay? And in particular, what that thing is telling you is that it is hard for this ellipse, okay, for this pneumaticity to be directly related or, or originate mostly from a, for example, uniaxial strain, which is very strong in your sample. Okay, because if you, you know, if it was a mechanical structural strain that is established in your sample, that would not be so dependent on small doping density. Okay, so the fact that it rotates, that the systematicity director can rotate, is a strong indication that something else is going on, and that is that this pneumaticity is of electronic, is most likely of electronic origin. Now, in addition to measuring the critical magnetic field, you know, we can do something different. We can say, okay, let me not apply a magnetic field such that I kill superconductivity. Let me actually do the following. Let me apply a small magnetic field and now just measure instead the critical current as a function of that magnitude and angle of your magnetic field. So that we're always deep in the superconducting state and it's just by running the current that I see where the critical current is, okay? So this is a set of videos. It's going to be a little bit complicated. I just, I just want to give you a flavor for all this physics, okay? You can see, again, more details in the reference. These different panels are showing parallel, you know, the videos are going to show the evolution with uh, magnetic field. You know, this is, well, let me tell you first of all. So the horizontal axis is current bias, okay? Amount of current that we're sending through our sample. The vertical axis is the angle of our magnetic field, okay? Different panels, indicate different magnitudes of the parallel magnetic field. And the evolution in the video is going to be the density evolution, okay? So let me run these videos. You can see that as a vary density, you know, there's a lot of changes here, you know, and anisotropies. Let me just 
in the next slide, just take a snapshot, which I've taken for a density in, in some you know, units of 0.6. Okay? What you can see here now, let, let's focus, for example, on this panel here, is that there's some direction as a function of angle where the system is superconducting. Superconducting means blue. The system is superconducting for some angles, okay? Whereas for others, the system is actually insulated. It's not only not superconducting, but actually has a peak in the differential resistivity, which is what I'm showing here, okay? So as a function of angle, the system has either finite critical current or zero critical current, and in fact, you know, goes into normal state, okay? So this can be perhaps a bit more clearly seen in these differential resistance curves as a function of current bias. You can see these different curves, which are offset, the offset is just magnetic field increments in, sorry, the rotation increments in 15 degrees, okay? The, the red trace is zero degrees orientation and you have finite switching current, okay? And now you can see that the switching current evolves with the magnetic field. It has two maxima indicated again, this ellipse, this twofold anisotropy, okay? So now we have this pneumaticity in the superconducting state of the system, okay? Let me go back to the normal state, okay? So we have this, again, phase diagram, temperature versus density. You know, we have the superconducting dome. We have the correlated instability state for two holes per molar unit cell. We have this resistance wedge, okay, with a depletion of TC there. Now, these are measurements in the color scale. This is a measurement of the longitudinal resistivity. What happens if I take measurements of the transverse resistivity? So the equivalent of making, of doing a whole measurement, but at zero magnetic field, no magnetic field applied, okay? I, with respect to Z, nothing, okay? But what happens is if you measure the whole resistance, okay, whole in quotes, because that's zero magnetic field, so the transverse resistance, our actual resistance, we see this very strong signal, okay, which occurs exactly where this wedge is, okay? Now, why would you have any finite transverse resistance at zero magnetic field, okay? So let me tell you the following. Let's imagine you have an anisotropic material, okay? So it's a two-dimensional material. This is the resistivity tensor, the X, and the XX resistivity rho one and the Y resistivity rho two is here, okay? Now, if your sample axis, your device axis are aligned with this, you know, anisotropic resistivity axis, then when you measure the transverse resistance, you expect to measure zero, okay? At zero magnetic field. Now, however, if your device axis, you know, if your sample, the way you fabricate it, you have no idea what's the orientation with respect to those, to those anisotropy axis, then you have to rotate your resistivity tensor. And as long as you don't have sine of two theta, this rotation angle equal to zero, okay? You will measure a finite rho x y resistivity if the system is anisotropically. And in fact, that you know, measurement is giving you a sense of what is the anisotropy which is present in your system, okay? So in our magic angle graphing devices, we don't know what are the crystallographic orientations of our magic angle graphing. So we in general shape our whole bar devices in you know, along some direction, which is, you know, in general, arbitrary with respect to this anisotropy axis, okay? So we have, you know, I'm showing you in this data actually a corrected RXY, just trying to correct for any possible artifact that says, such as rho XX, you know, rho XY misalignment in the electrodes, etc. And the more we correct, the actually the stronger the anisotropy becomes, okay? And it becomes particularly strong in this region what I showed you before. We also have this resistivity wedge. Yeah. In fact, you can divide RXY by RXX, and you can see that this is a extremely strong anisotropy of order of 50%, okay? So this is a very strong anisotropic system, actually, much more than one would have naively expected. So I should mention, by the way, that nematicity in the normal state of the system has been seen, you know, some evidence reported in STM work, you know, by you know, the Columbia and by Rutgers groups. So the thing that is becoming now clear, okay, is the following. 
this is what the, how the picture is evolving. The phase diagram of magic and graphene around two holes per molar unit. You know, at two holes per molar unit cell, we have a correlated insulated state. Now, in some angular range, you know, we see this behavior again for samples which have typically pretty high TC, so around 107 degrees plus minus 0.03 degrees more or less. Okay, we have this resistance wedge at about sort of 10% doping from the correlated insulated state. This resistance wedge exhibits normal state anisotropies consistent with the normal state nematicity, which competes with superconductivity, such that in the superconducting dome, you have a depletion around that region where the normal state anisotropy is. Okay? Now, in the superconducting state, we measure anisotropy everywhere in the superconducting dome. Okay, We have this pneumatic superconductivity everywhere in the superconducting dome. That happens actually for all of the samples where we have measured this, done this in-plane magnetic field measurement, which take you know, many months, so we don't always do them. But all of the samples, six and counting, where we have made this in-plane magnetic field anisotropy measurements, all of them exhibit everywhere in the superconducting dome, this pneumaticity for magic angle graphene samples, okay? Now, for these samples that exhibit this normal state resistivity, this, you know, the orientation of this pneumatic axis in the superconductivity, it evolves gradually with density in this region, but as we reach the region where we have this normal state pneumaticity, the superconducting axis strongly reorients itself. So most likely this normal state pneumaticity is telling the superconductivity all the parameter, now I want you to align in this direction, okay? So there is probably some correlation between the smooth rotation of the superconducting pneumatic axis in this region and the rather rapid reorientation of the axis here in this region, okay? So although we believe the pneumaticity might be of different origin in general in the superconducting dome and in the normal state, most likely this normal state pneumaticity has a strong effect in reorienting the order parameter, the superconducting order parameter in this narrow density range here. Okay, and again, as I mentioned, you can see a lot more details in this publication, which is posted. Now, in the last few minutes, let me tell you about um, some of our other recent work. So I should mention, by the way, that this work is done in very close collaboration with a group of Shahali Lani at the Weizmann Institute and our theory colleagues there. So this is again a phase diagram of magic and graphene, you know, and just a slightly different versions. Here I'm showing now that at each integer, you know, you have interesting correlated insulator or correlated semi-metal, semi Dirac semi-metal, Dirac insulator states. This depends, you know, on, on, on a number of parameters. In general, most of these energy scales are of order 4K, in particular superconductivity is always seen below 4K. And, you know, the bad insulator behavior occurs, you know, Typical energy scale here is of 100 Kelvin or, or a bit larger. Now, let me show you, um, um, you know, what happens. You know, this was the picture as of very recently. Let me show you what happened recently. So, in a couple of papers, you know, this is this is our paper and 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 uh, you know a related work by the group of Ali Yazdani appear back to back in the same issue. Okay, and this paper came out on my birthday, so I was <laughs> quite happy about it. Um, we showed that there is a cascade of phase transition, okay, which happen as you go through the integer fillings, you know, one, two, three, four electrons per molar unit cell in this system, okay. And these were, you know, measurements, you know, the first thermodynamic measurements, you know, of magic angle graphene. So not only transport, you know, they were uh, having quite a few transport experiments, but it was the first thermodynamic. Uh, uh, no, sorry, not the first. There was an uh, earlier paper by my colleague Ray Ashuri about it, but the first local thermodynamic measurements of magic angle graphene. So I want to tell you about electronic compressibility. This is d and d mu. So how does the charge density in the system change as you change the chemical potential mu? Okay, which in a single particle picture, this is proportional to your density of states. Okay, in particular, what we measure in these experiments is inverse compressibility. So d mu d n. How does the chemical potential change as a function of the, our control knob, which is the charge density. So the phenomenology, given this simple interpretation of you know, d mu dn as inverse density of states is the following. If you have an energy gap in your system, d mu dn is expected to be 
infinite because of the energy gap or you know in realistic terms a peak okay large maximum if you have a dirac like dispersion you know your density state is proportional to square root of density therefore your dmu dn is proportional to one over square root of density if you have superconductivity because that does not lead to a signal you know in the thermodynamic density of states then in principle you expect no signal okay so let me show you our data these are local inverse compressibility measurements used uh, performed using a scanning carbon nanotube single electron transistor so we have a tip which has at the end of the afm tip you know it's not an afm tip it's similar it has a, a carbon nanotube which is an acting as a single electron transistor so it's a very sensitive voltmeter okay voltage meter and we have we scan this tip above a magic angle graphene sample okay? we can measure transport in our magic angle graphene sample and we see you know correlating silicon states at two holes and two electrons per molar unit cell and superconducting domes nearby okay so this is the way the data look like what we measure is this trace dmu dn this black trace you can see that as a function of density we have these two large peaks which correspond to the gaps the band insulator gaps at four electrons and four holes per molar unit cell another peak at the charge neutrality point because it's a region of zero density of states um, corresponding to the direct point of graphene of, of magic angle graphene also a peak there if you integrate the mu dn you can actually look at the chemical potential as a function of density okay and then again we can do this mapping locally okay if you will look at one of you know at, at a given feature that tell us you know for example one of these peaks which tells us what's the angle for this magic angle graphene device because this van insulator peak tells you what the angle is you can see that as a function of you know location we can find that this angle is changing locally okay because this is a device which has a certain area and there are locally variations on the twist angle okay now let me tell you the you know and, and this is you know, we have, I have only a couple of slides left. Let me just tell you what do we measure, okay? As we go through the different, you know, twist angles, what we see are these traces of inverse compressibility, okay? I want you to focus on the fact that for 1.31 degrees, this is almost featureless, except for the gaps, the band insulator gaps and the charge neutrality point. For 0.99 degrees, also only weak features, Okay, but in between in this magic angle range, take for example the strays 113 or 107 degrees, you see the sawtooth behavior, okay, the sawtooth behavior in the inverse electronic compressibility. Okay? If you integrate it, it means that in the chemical potential, you have these steps in the chemical potential. These steps indicate a series, a cascade, we call it, of phase transitions, where your chemical potential is resetting, you know. Every integer okay now this is you know the data that i showed before with a finite magnetic field but in higher quality more recent samples that we have this occurs also at zero magnetic field and you have this very strong behavior okay now this behavior is something that is very robust it occurs all the way to about i'm showing data here up to 16 kelvin but we have more recent data up to about 30 kelvin this occurs this is already happening at relatively high energies well above typical correlated insulated states and superconducting states, okay? And the way we interpret this is the following. At charge neutrality, you have these four data cones coming from the K and K prime valleys and spin up and spin down. So you have these four flavors, which are in the simplest approximation degenerate, okay? So as you start filling with charge these flavors, all four flavors fill at the same time. Okay, now close to, but before one electron per molar unit cell. So when you're close to filling one quarter of these flavors each, okay, one quarter each means one electron per molar unit cell because we have four flavors, then a phase transition happens, okay, where the system suddenly decides it's due to Coulomb interactions, it's energetically more flavor to occupy, more, more favorable to occupy a single flavor. So the charge goes to one flavor, okay? And then, you know, the charge goes to one flavor and the rest of the flavors get empty, okay? So they go back to charge neutrality and then the process starts again. I start filling these three remaining flavors. At some point, 
rather than continue paying kinetic, you know, Coulomb energy, you know, because it's from the point of view of kinetic energy favorable, actually this interaction becomes so strong that it's favorable to again spontaneously flavor polarize and empty the other two flavors and so on and so forth, okay? So this cascade of phase transitions, which is happening, which is giving you this behavior of, this subtle behavior of the compressibility back to roughly the behavior you expect for, you know, Adida cone being filled, okay? Now, you can see a lot more in the paper that I mentioned, but this explains a number of things that we, you know, a number of puzzles that we had observed, you know, in our original discovery. For example, the fact that you have only two-fold degeneracy, you know, beyond two electrons per molar unit cell, rather than the four-fold degeneracy in the land of fan diagrams stemming from the charge neutrality point. This two-fold degeneracy is just because you have now two flavors left. Okay? It also explains this Fermi surface reconstruction, you know, that we observed in the whole resistance, and that is because you go back to charge roughly, you know, not quite, but roughly charge neutrality as you start feeding the new flavors, you know, the two remaining flavors from Rinko's theory. So with this, I want to mention that in this phase diagram, now we know that we have this Fablo symmetry broken parent state, which occurs at high energies of the order of 30 Kelvin, and the rest of the physics of the system, correlated insulated state, superconductivity, et cetera, happens at lower energies, but it's happening in this background of flavor symmetry broken state, which plays a prominent role for the correlated states at lower energies. And with this, um, let me skip the summary since I'm late and go to the acknowledgement. So this has been done, you know, by my grad students, you know, Yuan Sao, Daniel Rodan, and, and Jane Park. You know, uh, we have plenty of collaborators at MIT and, and you know Minnesota, Harvard, and Japan. And the scanning single electron transistor, you know, this last uh, bit that I told you about has been done in collaboration with a group of Shahalilani. Uh, at the Weizmann Institute and our theory colleagues there in Berlin. And I didn't show you this, but we also have very interesting work with Elie Soltov that you know, I hope to tell you some other time. I want to uh, thank our sponsors. In particular, I'm very happy that you know, recently the Fundación Ramon RSS started funding my lab, uh, for which I'm, I'm really grateful. And thank you all for your attention. OK. Thank you very much, Pablo. Great talk. I see that you are still providing new terms such as cascade of phase transitions, direct <laughs> revivals, so you never stop. Eh? <laughs> okay, there are already a few questions in the chat. So please, if you have some questions, use the chat. Jose Hugo Garcia asks, does this nematicity survive to higher temperature? Is it something that may be understandable within the single particle uh, picture? So, the nematicity, um, let me, I showed this, but it was a little bit fast. So let me go back to it. All right. There are two aspects of it. There is the nematicity in the, you know, the nematicity in the superconducting state is, um, the nematicity in the superconducting state is only present in the superconducting state, okay? We don't see signatures of nematicity. Let's say here, we are in the superconducting state, you know, at the edge the overdope, you know, in the overdope region, we don't see clear signatures of nematicity right above it in the normal state, okay? So everywhere in the superconducting state there's nematicity, but it belongs to the superconducting state. Now, if you mean the nematicity in the normal state, which occurs in a narrow density range, you can see that this nematicity is present until about 10 Kelvin, okay? And it's most pronounced below six, seven Kelvin, okay? So, it's not something that survives all the way to you know, very high temperature, okay? And we think it stems from electronic interactions, okay? And it's not something that it can be spent in a single particle picture, but more, you know, more research needs to be done about exactly precisely what is, you know, the microscopic mechanism that is taking place here for this nematicity to occur. Okay, another question is by Saul Garcia Orrit. He's asking, is there any kind of dependence in the superconducting response depending on the magnetic field polarization? So I guess he means the sense of the magnetic field. Yes, yeah, so the measurements that I, um, so again, I don't, I'm not sure if they mean the magnetic field uh, for the superconducting or the normal state. So let me reply to both. The super, you know, the, the superconducting pneumatic state is a response that we see in, you know, uh, uh, 
as a, as a function of the in-plane magnetic field magnitude and orientation. So of course, there is a response. That's the response that we're measuring. Yeah? We have also applied, for example, in, you know, when, when we have optimal doping where it is too strong the superconductivity to be able to see the critical field within our one Tesla in-plane field, what we can do also is apply a small perpendicular magnetic field so that we suppress TC and then do this in-plane field orientation. And we see also nematicity, okay? So, but that's a natural response in the superconductive state because we're measuring the critical field. In the normal state, okay, we can apply, in fact, it's a, it's a hidden slide I believe that I have here. If you apply a small perpendicular magnetic field to kill the superconductivity, then you can measure rho x y and subtract the whole signal, okay? And then you see also that this nematicity is present without superconductivity, just in the normal state at finite perpendicular magnetic field, we also see this transverse voltage. Again, I subtracted the whole signal. So this is without whole signal, okay? And uh, we can see that it's also present. Um, down, you know, at these small magnetic fields, there's not a strong dependence of it. We haven't, you know, when you apply a very high perpendicular magnetic field, you have actually now, you know, quantum hole effect and land of fun diagrams, and you have a different response in the rho x y, okay? So it's, it's not so easy to subtract this effect, but certainly in a small perpendicular magnetic field, it also survives. Pablo San Jose asks, is the nematic axis reproducible in a given sample? So, namely, if you cycle a sample to high temperatures and then lower temperature again, do you see the same, the same axis? That's a very good question. So we see that, you know, we haven't done the full experiment. Uh, let me go, no, sorry, let me go here, for example. So we haven't done the experiment where, you know, these experiments take again months and, you know, but we, we have done warm up to room temperature and then come back down. We see that roughly the nematicity, you know, initially we thought it was roughly in the same orientation because the map looked quite similar. Now, in the one instance where we went in a very, you know, we park our density and we went to high temperature and came back down exactly at the same temperature, uh, sorry, exactly at the same doping, not exactly at the same temperature, unfortunately, we didn't do that, but we were at a little bit different temperature. We had seen that the orientation had changed by about 15 or 20 degrees. So it's not exactly the same, but the overall tendency is the same. So, you know, this, this question, you know, um, brings me to an interesting point, which is, you know, in principle, if you have spontaneous symmetry breaking, okay, the system could choose any director that it wanted, you know, and, and in fact, with our magnetic field, we would expect to even perhaps be rotating that director, okay? So the fact that we see a given orientation for a given density most likely indicates that there is a little bit of residual strain, which is spinning rather than letting it spin freely, the nematic direction, spinning the direction of the nematicity, okay? Now, that's a small, you know, pinning due to a small residual strain, okay? When you include interactions, and again, I, I refer you to our uh, posted work here, okay? You can see that when you include interactions, now, the fact that you have a little bit of strain pinning it allows for that rotation of the nematic axis direction as a function of density, okay? If it was strongly, you know, if it was a strong strain, you would not be able to rotate that nematicity, okay? It's also the amount of, you know, the nematicity, the strength of nematicity we see where in, you know, for the, for the strongest uh, cases, we see more than a factor of three difference between this, you know, the critical field in one direction and another. If you calculate what's the amount of strain that you should have to have such a strong difference, is, is really huge, okay? So it's very unlikely with that with such a huge strain, you would be able to rotate it, you know, as we see over a broad angular range, if it was due to strain. Okay, thank you. So the chat is very hot, but we only have time for maybe a couple of questions because in 10 minutes, the semi-plenary semi talks uh, will start. So there is one question by Lucia Val. Uh, is the nematicity reflected in some twofold symmetry of the band, band structure? If it has been measured and or calculated, sorry if I miss it. So the you know the electronic structure of the system has this threefold or sixfold, you know, depending on which values you look at, etc. Let me, I think I have a 
backup slide here with you know some of this. You know, this is you know the electronic structure you know uh, calculated. As you can see, this is for one valley, this is for the other valley. It has you know threefold or sixfold symmetry. Okay, and precisely that's sort of the point of what I'm saying. If we would have seen a critical field which had threefold symmetry, okay, then I wouldn't be talking about this nematicity. What nematicity does is it takes your rotational symmetry of your system, which is manifested then in your electronic structure, take your rotational symmetry of your system, and rather than exhibiting that rotational, discrete lattice rotational symmetry, it exhibits just a twofold rotational symmetry, a C2 symmetry. The fact that the system goes from you know, C3 to C2, that corresponds to this pneumatic uh, transition of your other parameter, okay? So precisely in the electronic structure, there's no such twofold, you know, you have a threefold. The fact that we see this twofold response of the system, that tells you the system is pneumatic. And last uh, question uh, by Right Deep uh, Sensarma. Is the sequence of valley spin symmetry breaking understood in the cascade of phase transitions? Are these experiments you can do to settle this? Other experiments oh, you can do to settle very, this? Very interesting question. Let me see, I think I have a, yeah, I have here a backup slide for this, okay? If you look near nu equals one, okay? Near nu equals one and you apply an in-plane parallel magnetic field, you can see that the chemical potential, this is the chemical potential of the system, evolves from zero field to finite magnetic field. We have actually uh, nicer data now. It evolves in a given manner, okay? From using the Maxwell's relations, you can look at uh, the magnetization of the system directly from these measurements, because the partial derivative of the chemical potential with magnetic field is related to the partial derivative of the magnetization with density, which is what's plotted in this inset. And you can see there is a buildup of magnetization in the system as you apply a parallel magnetic field. So in this, across nu equals one, the system, okay, when at least at finite magnetic field becomes spin polarized at finite magnetic field. Now, at zero temperature and at zero magnetic field, okay, something very interesting happens which I don't, you know, I, I haven't shown here is something that we're gonna post in the archive this week, but there is something called a Pomeranchuk effect, okay? The system, well, actually not at zero temperature, at finite temperature, but the system is actually very soft paramagnet, you know, the spins are, you know, can oscillate, you know, the, you know, as a function of temperature, your system, or as a function, you know, as a function of temperature, your system goes from a, liquid to a solid, as a functional magnetic field goes from a solid with random moments to a solid with parallel spins, okay? Because it becomes polarized at very small magnetic fields. And all of that behavior is partially reflected here in the magnetization of the system after nu equals one. And again, in this more recent study as a function of temperature and magnetic field that we will post this week, okay? But it's a very, very interesting thing. And I think, you know, microscopically, we still have to determine exactly what's the nature of the ground state at nu equals one because they're exhibiting a, a, a very rich behavior. I, I cannot hear you, Pablo. Oh, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, we can. Yes, I think we can hear you, yes. Okay, yeah, uh, I don't know if, if, if you missed my response to the previous question or? <laughs> I think we got it, right? Oh, okay, so maybe it's Jose yeah. Maria, the one yeah, who has Maria. Maria. internet. Yeah. Okay, okay, very good. Um, Jose Maria, can you hear me? Can you hear us? No. Yeah. yeah, so maybe we can close the session. Yeah, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you everyone. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Paul. <laughs> So maybe we can applaud. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, okay. So maybe if you unshare your screen and everyone open their their camera, we can take a picture. I mean there are many people here, but uh, I can try to take pictures, <laughs> a few pictures. So we have some kind of um, yeah, oh a lot of people already. Okay, very good, great. 
Okay, so I'm taking pictures, okay? So just smile all the time. I have seven pages, okay? <laughs> so I'm starting. Okay. One. Two. Three. Okay, there's people here. Cameras, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some people aren't even already. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, <laughs> for staying. And uh, just join us for the next one, the next two um, talks. There are two semi-plenaries, and you have all the information in the, uh, in the web page. So see you now. Bye. Bye.